Hey, good morning. I hope you're having a good start to your morning. So I want to tell you that I love the Lord. He really is my best friend, but I don't always like the level of honesty that he brings me to. Yeah, no, nope. But I have to laugh really because it's the best analogy that he could think of. Well, I don't know if he could think of, but it's the one he gave me. So I'm going to tell you a quick story here. I am 5'5". Five five. I was 5'6", but I think when you get older, you kind of settle like a house, you know. So I lost an inch. So I'm about 5'5", five five, probably around 139, 140 pounds, which is more than what I want to be and more than what I have been this year. So I talk a lot about going to the gym, and I went probably pretty much regularly on almost an everyday basis. I got to just walking in and doing things here and there to stay in shape. I'm 63, almost 64. And uh, yeah, the wrinkles really give it away. But I feel pretty young at heart. And um, I really want to stay in the best shape that I'm able to so that I can not only look good, feel good for my age, but also just to be able to do whatever the Lord calls me to do. You know, he says... Uh, for us to glorify him in these earthen vessels, in these in this temple, and to take care of it. And so we all do the best we can, I think, uh, with what we have as far as money to be able to do things. And I don't know about you, but the healthier I want to eat and the, the better I want to take care of myself, the more it costs me and more it costs you. It's ridiculous. But that's where they get us. So we do the best we can with what we have. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, I went through a domestic violence of sorts uh, some years ago. And when I did, I was in a lot of pain in the inside. And I, it wasn't a physical one. It was more emotional. And what happened was I really just didn't have anybody on the radar. I was so full of grief and disillusionment and... I didn't understand how what happened happened. So I got into this mindset where I was keeping busy all the time in ministry so I didn't have to deal with it. And when I was by myself, it was harder because even though I had a dog at the time, I mean, if I wasn't studying, if I wasn't doing something, if I was sitting and I was journaling, it was like the Lord was pulling me back to look at things that I just didn't want to look at. And uh, it didn't feel good at all. And I felt very alone. So I ended up eating for comfort. I didn't eat too much. I don't want you to think that. I tell you, I didn't. But I ate things that, uh, I don't know, affected the chemicals, I guess, in my brain. Feel good things. Sugar. Yeah. Carbs. Yeah. Those kind of things. So I didn't eat a lot. But I just ate what comforted me. And over time, and I wasn't really paying attention, but I could feel it in my clothes, I started to put on weight. So I think I got up to about 170 pounds. And that was too much for me because I feel terrible when I, when I weigh that. And it's only been a couple of times in my life, but it's terrible. And you, you don't feel good in your clothes. You don't feel good. So I began to cry out to God. I'm like, God, I need help here. And I can remember it probably took... I don't know, months. And I would get upset and I couldn't afford to get other clothes. And I just kept going to the Lord with it all the time. And I said, God, I'm just weak. I cannot change. And I would try, you know, and, uh, you know, I would go eat an apple and the carbs, the sugar addiction, it would call me. So I could eat anything healthy and still have that. So I'm like, I should just eat the cookie, you know? Have you ever been there? And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a food addiction. There are things that we run to for comfort. It can be shopping, it can be sex, it can be drugs, alcohol. It can be not even anything bad. It can just be something, a binging on a Netflix series. It can be something that just takes us away from focusing on the issues at hand and not focusing on the Lord. It's an escape. And so as I began to pray about it, the Lord kept telling me, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And I'm like, well, when? You know, this is not working. And I'm not able to do this on my own. 
So I just had to admit to the Lord that I was just powerless in the situation. And I can remember when I left where I was and I went to Florida for five months uh, on a sabbatical and um, picked up a part-time job and I had a really great young Christian couple I was living with. They were amazing. And I began to do some yard work and the Lord said, let's go join the gym. So that's when I started again. And uh, I really uh, became faithful with that. And I worked out in the yard and I went walking with my dog and I really, really started to, over time, get into really good shape again. And um, whenever I moved, uh, the gym that I belonged to was almost everywhere. So I was able to, no matter where I went, uh, after I left Florida, I was able to go and just continue. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to tell you, for the the point uh, is not to just be in good shape it was good mentally it's a good stress release it's a good way to take the tension and the stress that might be negative and not all of it is negative we need a certain amount of it for health I've, i really believe that it's like today we live in a world where you know everybody is so uh sanitizing conscious our soap everything you know, and I think to a point it's okay, but I think we go crazy, and then all of a sudden our bodies are left uh, vulnerable and immune, and uh, not as immune to things because we're not subjected to certain things. So I think for our bodies to remain strong, we have to be subjected to things that we resist um, and we work against in order to be the best that we can be. So... Um, just trying to go to the gym and then committing to eating right and then honestly not having a lot of money, it makes it easier. Um, so I, I really got into a place, I'd say about six, seven months ago, or probably a little bit longer, where I was really at peak. I really was. I was doing well. And then I went through a homeless stint, and that just made everything fall apart. So when you get to be our age and you go two, three months without really... Uh, being committed, even if you're walking, even if you're cycling, which I did, you just, yeah, you lose it quick. So, um, and then the Lord has just come in and closed up shop here. Pretty much, he said the word, things are going to change and everything is closed. So here I am, still involved in some things, but pretty much with a lot of time on my hands. And because of the heat, and even though I've started going back to the gym again, I'm going to tell you this, my eating habits have gone backwards. Not a lot, but enough. Enough where it makes a difference with uh, the lack of uh, movement and the lack of, of just my normal life. So the last couple of days, I have been putting on clothes and going, God, look at this. How did I get here again? And all of this has a point, so just humor me. And this is why I say I love the Lord, but yeah, he just, yeah. I don't, I don't like his level of honesty in my life sometimes. So uh, this morning, I, I mean, I got dressed and because uh, I'm getting ready to go to the gym and I put on clothes and I'm like, God, how do we get here again, again? And this is what he told me. He said, you're trying to stay in shape in one area and that's fine. But you went backwards over here. And you're going back to the carbs and back to the sugar and back to this. And I said, I know, I know. I said, can't seem to get away from it. He said, well, you can have. And, and wow, he's bringing this. And it was, it was going to be for later, but he's bringing this now. He said, you can have the best intentions and go the wrong direction. Remember that. You can have the best of intentions, but be going in a wrong direction. So, again, even right now, he's showing me the archer with the arrow. You know, it's so important that our thoughts, words, and actions line up. It's so important that when an archer is going to try to shoot an arrow to hit the target, dead center, everything has to be lined up. Body, breath, it's all about alignment. And I'm out of alignment again. Yeah, I know. So this leads into the word that the Lord uh, has given me today for the church, for the bride, the body of Christ as a whole. So, I don't know who prayed last night, but I think a lot of people did because I felt the prayers last night. I laid down last night, and I thought I was in heaven. I mean, my bed felt so comfortable last night. The temperature was perfect. The weight of the blanket, everything was just, and I went out cold. 
And I think I woke up once, or maybe twice, and I went right back to sleep. Excuse me, but when I woke up about, I think it was one o'clock, I felt to reach for my phone and I looked at my email and Lisa Turkhurst had written an article in there <clears throat> about, I think it was about leadership. And anyway, if you look on River Russo on Facebook, you'll see it posted. Uh, it just says Le Lisa Turkhurst and it was about leadership. And I was like curious. I'm like, God, why is this in my inbox? And I know you, if you don't understand, you don't understand, but I really just give God everything. And he brings me the articles. He brings me the music um, that he wants me to hear. Uh, Watchman on the Wall is an amazing prophetic ministry. And every day, every day, he gives me two to three of those, all three of those things that just fit. And this morning, yeah, they're posted there too. It just fit. And they're all like pieces of a puzzle that the Lord will put together for me in the morning. And then I go to my study time either before or after, and it all meshes. It's just, he's amazing. He's God. He's God. Yeah. So I was reading the article by Lisa Turkhurst last night, and I'm thinking, I'm curious, God, what are you saying? And, you know, is this something that doesn't fit? Because there are times when you know it doesn't resonate, you know, or not at the moment, even though it's good. So I went back to sleep, and I woke up this morning, and I said, you know, Lord, what do you want to, go today in our quiet time and study. And he took me to First Thess Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 2. And it was all about church leadership. I am not going to read these things because he gave me a lot. But I'm going to um, I'm going to give you an overview and if you want to look through things uh to get the mind of the Lord in this, I will give it to you. So let me just give you the scriptures and you can go and look, okay? And we might talk about some of them. So Isaiah 52 was written about Jerusalem. And she's pictured as a woman sitting up against a wall with shackles, okay? And what the Lord showed me in a vision is that this woman had a choker around her neck which was a shackle chain to a wall and she had shackles on her wrists chains and on her legs the problem was okay uh when he showed me this vision and when i read isaiah 52 is he said this is my bride this is the church and this is not the first time he's had me go back to this because even though the video is not there uh, he gave me this message when I was in North Carolina. I was sitting in a restaurant, and I was reading a book by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. And all of a sudden, the Lord began to just, and I wrote it in the pages of the cover inside as fast as I could write it, what he was giving me. And he showed me, and when I looked it up on my phone, he said, this is a picture of the bride of Christ. He said, she's not even shackled. She's not a captive, but she thinks she is. So she's still sitting up against the wall. And if you read it very carefully, you'll see where he said to her, get up. He didn't say, I'm going to get you up. He said, get up, shake the dust off yourself. And if you read it, it's very descriptive. Um, and it, he's talking about the church now. You're a sleeping giant. And this morning, I saw in a vision where this person was going over and literally poking this bride, like goading her, get up, get up, wake up. And it was just like that. It was very, uh, it wasn't that, come on, honey, it's time to get up now. You know, it wasn't gentle and it wasn't entirely nice. It was a poke, a prod. It's like when your mom or your dad come in and you need to get up for school and you're a teenager and you don't want to. Yeah, it was like that. It's like, let's go. I'm done playing. So that's kind of what I felt in the spirit today. The Lord is done playing. So then <clears throat> he took me to 1 Thessalonians 2. And then he took me to Jeremiah 22 and 23 and was talking about the false and lying prophets. Wow, this is going to really tick some people off, but yeah, I don't care. 
So what the Lord said, and he showed me, and he took me to the picture. He said, I'm coming back to clean out my temple, and I'm turning over the money changers' tables. And I know there's a lot of people that are going to love this, and there's a lot of people that aren't going to say that. They aren't going to like this, I mean. But I'm just going to say this. Everything is a balance. For a church, ministry, fellowship to survive, we need to be faithful to pay tithes because it's a ministry, and you cannot put out something without sowing into it. That's true. When it comes to um, conferences and things like that, we're going to split some hairs here. Let me just say this overall. For everything in the house of God, it takes some money sometimes to get things to where the Lord has given a vision and to keep them running. That's a given. It's a no-brainer. Okay, it's like a business. It's the same thing. And I'm not talking about the church being a business. I said it's like having a business. Let me clarify. You start a business, no matter what it is, you need capital. You need to invest. Sometimes you need invest ors, okay? A lot of times. And you have to keep investing in your company and reinvesting and re-envisioning to make it really excellent. So that's a given. Okay, and anybody that can sit back and say, the church is always asking for money. Okay, let's look at the balance of this. The balance of it is they need money to run. God's kingdom runs on his economy, not the world's economy. But it still needs uh, money to run because people that are giving their lives for the gospel need to be supported. And, like Paul, they need to work. To support themselves and their families. Unless <clears throat> God says otherwise. Unless they can't. It's how it is. So let's move that out of the way. Because that's okay. But now. And this is where we're going to really make some people mad. And I don't care. Because it's the truth. Okay. I will tell you that everywhere I go. Almost lately. Whether it's on social media. YouTube. Okay. And I'm not. I'm going to do this. Just stop. Because I'm going to do this. There are some people the Lord has said to do that. Maybe it's their life. I don't know. Not my business. Okay? But I want to put, keep putting that out of the way. Because I'm not going to say I'm God, and I'm not going to say God has not said to anybody to not do what they're doing. Okay? I'm sure there are some. But I'm talking to a great majority. A great majority. Okay? whether in church, whether they hold conferences, whether they're ministries, whether they're online ministries, okay? It's all about this. And stop. Don't hide behind it. Be truthful with yourself because this is what it's about. And what makes God mad and what makes me mad is the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given for the church to be a church, whether you're a pastor in leadership or whether you move in the prophetic, no matter what your giftings are, Jesus never charged for those things. Nowhere in the Bible will you see that he did, except for the people who had the demoniac, the woman that was full of demons, okay, who, who they exploited her and made money off her gifts. Paul, He was supported. It was his life's ministry, and he worked. We already said that's a given, but I'm not talking about those people. I'm not talking about what's right. I'm talking about what's wrong. I'm talking about everybody today is charging. Most everybody today is charging for the gifts the Holy Spirit has given them. When Jesus, the Holy Spirit, The Father has given us gifts to build up the body. He said, freely, it's been given to you. Freely give. So R, the question is this. I already know the answer because the Lord already woke me up and gave me this whole thing this morning. Are we being money changers in the house of God? Don't tell me we're not because he said we are. So here's what the Lord told me today. He asked me to look up his leadership qualities. And I'm going to tell you that the Spirit of God 
is very serious right now. Very serious. Like a righteous anger. Serious. And I'm going to tell you that the Lord has been giving me a lot of words about oppression. To rescue the poor, the needy, the oppressed. He gave me words this morning in Ezekiel 34 about false shepherds. In Jeremiah 22 and 23 about false and lying prophets. In, in Ezekiel. Another place in Ezekiel. And he was asking me to look up all his attributes as a leader. Jesus. So I wasn't quite awake yet. And I'm starting to look. And I'm looking. And I'm looking. And I'm looking. It's all here. His leadership is here. His model when he was alive. It's who he is. Now, if you start to really look into the great I am and all his qualities as a leader, and you look at the church, yeah, scary. Real scary. Look at his life, look at the church. Look at Jesus' life, look at the church. Look at the book of Acts, look at the church today. Wow, we're in trouble. So the Lord actually put it within me, and I'm going to say this is a prophetic word, so I'm just going to say this right out. If you are a church leader, you better start looking in the mirror because the Lord is looking at your heart. And like what he said to me about my shape and why he said this is because it's an analogy, an allegory for the church. You may have good intentions, but you're going in the wrong direction. And God is done. This is a time where he is going to shake his church like never before. And the thing that he is doing right now is warning. He's warning the church. Go in the mirror of God's word. Get in his presence. And start looking at yourself. Because if you don't, he will. And if you don't align yourself with his word and his spirit, if you don't get serious and we don't get the church in shape and we don't get her doing what she's supposed to be doing, God's going to do it for you. And that means, and he gave me this picture and the word this morning about it's time for the church to do some fall cleaning. We fell. We've fallen. We are so wretched. And I just feel the Spirit of God so intense right now and so serious. He's not playing. He's poking the church. Get up and do what you're called to do because you're a mess. You're a mess. This word is not for everyone in the church because there are people who are seeking the Lord with all their heart on their faces. Okay. And the Lord has given me this word. I'm going to say this. The other day I had to go to a meeting and I'm not going to get into it, but I was praying and the Lord told me, no, very vehemently, no. And as I was walking along and praying about this and I said, Lord, you know, you told me no. And I get that. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to budge. I'm going to do what you said. But I'm concerned because of other people that are involved. And you know what the Lord said to me? This, and he's bringing this right now. This is a season for the church to learn who the diamonds are in the church that he's made and who the diamonds are, the fake ones, the false ones, who the real sheep are and who the wolves are. And Jesus is saying right now to the wolves, I'm coming for you. Get out of my church. The last thing that he's given me, I believe this morning, I was making breakfast this morning and the Lord reminded me of a time when I first became homeless and I was reeling. I was reeling. I was broken and I was reeling. I was triggered. I was shattered in my heart. And I happened to, when I was walking one day, I met this man about my age and we started to have a conversation and all of a sudden it was like Satan just grabbed a hold of this man and the words and things that came out of his mouth and I was like whoa and I was just taken aback 
his whole demeanor changed and he became, wow, just nasty, perverted. And I just got away. And I was shaking a little bit from that because I was already dealing with so much of my own stuff. And, you know, even as a Christian and having been one for a long time, we still get into places where we're broken, we're broken. And we're, and we're trying to recover and we're trying to find a sense of balance. So the funny thing was, is after I had left him and actually went into a store, got a drink and kind of just slid away, um, I was coming back going back, but on the other side of the street. And I never saw him again that day. And um, I did later on, but I want to share what happened. I came upon this group of people and there was this young man and this young woman and they were talking together. And I, I just, like I said, I was just so caught up in my own headspace at the moment, but the Lord just kind of woke me up <clears throat> after I'd met that man. And I was paying attention to this young man and he was dressed like a Satanist. And he was casting spells and he was talking in this language that was of the enemy. And him and her were talking together. And I noticed while I was watching, it was kind of creepy. I had never seen anything like this before. Even though I didn't see in the spirit what was happening literally with my eyes, I watched as this group of people, all the demons that were in or upon the lives of these people were, were awakened. And it was like they were all playing off each other. And it began to build in such a crescendo. And I was sitting there and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the Lord said to me, get up and go over and tell that young man that I love him. I'm like, what? I'm like, Lord, I am not. Get up, go over and ask that young man if he knows who I am. And tell him that I love him. And I mean, I'm like, okay. So I swallowed hard and I got up and I walked over just because I was such a mess myself. And I walked over and I looked him square in the eye and I was like, the Holy Spirit just hit me. Boom. And I said, Jesus Christ sent me over to ask you a question. Do you know who he really is? And do you know that he loves you so much that he gave his life for you? And I watched this young man fold like an accordion. I watched the demonic just go, and I watched his face change, and I watched him just sit down and fall to the ground. And then the ripple effect was incredible. Every demonic spirit that had been ignited by this young man and by this girl, and I don't know where the girl went. I don't even remember if she left or what. I watched everything just come right back down to normal and people were just being normal again it was one of the most creepy but incredible things i had seen in a long time if well i'll never forget it so the thing is and i believe the lord is bringing this back to say this look <clears throat> there's wolves in the house pay attention they're causing a problem in the body of christ and leaders you know, this is mainly, and I'm going to say this today for leaders, that either God has called or you've put yourself there. If you put yourself there and God isn't sanctioning your being there, you need to leave. You need to leave stat because he will toss you out. If you have been called by God to be in leadership and you have compromised your duty as a leader in the body of Christ, this is a day of your reckoning. This is a day where the Lord is giving you a warning and coming to you and saying, put my house in order, but start with yours first. Yeah. So there's a lot here. A lot. And I hope that if you hear this message and you know of any fellowship leadership a person and you love them it isn't it isn't to be a jerk it isn't to to point fingers it it's we are being held accountable as the body of christ as the church as leaders in the church this is a day of holiness it's a day we talk about revival but revival has to come from us first inside out 
And I'm going to tell you, I was walking through, I mean, walking to the store yesterday. And I was telling the Lord because I was listening to this song. And, you know, sometimes God will use songs that are not Christian, so to speak. There'll be lines in songs that will come just like an arrow. Boom. And I was listening to a song yesterday and I got stuck and kept replaying this one place where the song said, I've had good intentions, but it probably doesn't even show. And the Lord said to me, I know in your heart, because I know you, that your intentions are good, but you're going in the wrong direction with those intentions. And I, had, I was like taken aback. So please, please, this is a good word. It's not a bad word. It's not a judgment word. It is a judgment word. It's a conviction word from the Lord to the church, to leadership, to every one of us. It's time to stop playing church. It's time to stop playing with God's house like it's toys that we get to buy and sell. It's time to quit playing around, to quit pushing grace past where it belongs. And I'm sorry. And I know this is going to offend people, and I can't help it. I love people. I want to learn to love just like Jesus loves. He loves everybody. It doesn't matter where you are, what you do, what you believe, what you don't. He loves you. And that's the love that I want him to cultivate in my heart. If you step outside the word of God as a church and you endorse any lifestyle, any way of doing anything that doesn't line up with the word, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because what you're doing is you're catering to man and their wants and their needs. You're tingling the ears. You don't do go in the wrong direction because your intentions are good. I'm your, I'm your case in point here. Your intentions might be good, but you're going in the wrong direction. The word of God is our authority, his authority. And I think if he can keep this world spinning in space, he can keep this word pure if he wants to. So, I ask that if you hear this today, that you send it to everybody you think will benefit from it. And that the first thing I need to do and you need to do is get your house in order. Get your house in order. God's not playing. He's coming back. And the last thing he gave me today was this. Remember the ten bridesmaids. Five were welcomed. Five hit the road. I don't know who you are. You may look the part, but you don't know me and I don't know you. So bye. And I hate to say it. God doesn't send people to hell. He gives us an invitation to be with him forever. You choose where you go on your own. Gifts, Christ's life, his birth, his death, his life while he was here, his death and his resurrection, all of it are a gift. And he's given it to every person who will receive it. If you don't receive it, that's your choice. Free will. If you don't get holy, if you are not made in his image and likeness as he calls us to be, you're not going anywhere with him. I don't care what you think. I don't care what your grandma said. I don't care if he looks like your happy grandfather. If it doesn't line up with a word, it ain't happening. You can say gravity doesn't happen and I dare you to go jump off your roof. And I really don't mean it and it isn't for kids. But I'm saying, you can say I don't believe in gravity, but I guarantee you that if you step off that roof, you're going to hit the ground. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you believe or what you don't believe. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care what you think about him or what you think about what's right and wrong. He doesn't care. He's not leaving it up to you. He's the creator. He is God. He is I am. He loves you so much that he gave his life for you, but he doesn't really care what your thoughts are because his thoughts are right. He's God. 
You're not. You're a little person among many. And the devil is already destroyed. And it says in Isaiah, I believe it's 14, maybe 13, 14. You'll have to look it up. He talks about the king, I believe, of Assyria, but he's talking about Satan. He's little, Lucifer. He's tiny. And the nations are going to look at him one day and go, we were afraid of you. It's because he blows himself up bigger than life. He's a liar. He's a liar. Don't fall for the lies. Get your house in order. Get to Christ. Get in the house. And leaders, it's time for you to take your stand because you are going to be tested by the world. You're going to be tested by the enemy. And if you have to be put in a place where you have to give your life for the truth, you better be ready to do that or you better step down and let somebody else get in the position that will do that because it's coming. This is how serious this word is right now. Jesus is going to clean his house. He is going to get his bride ready without spot and without wrinkle. And you're either going to get in line and be a part of that and go through the fire and get rid of the spots or you're going to be out. That's it. That's it. And it starts right here with this person, with God telling me, you may have good intentions, but you're going in the wrong direction. Let's reel it in, tie it up. And I'm going to tell you, I was on my face asking God to make me holy, which invites the fire, which I don't always like, but I need it. How about you? So I did my job because that's what the last verses were. Thank you, Lord, and Ezekiel. And you know what? I'm going to read this to you. Thank you. I forgot what that was about, but he reminded me. See, God does everything so perfect. That's why he's God. And we just need to get in line. So this is what he said in... Okay, it is Ezekiel 3. And I'm going to read this so you know that I'm doing my job because this is what he gave me. And this is what I'm called to be in the prophetic. And I don't always like being here because sometimes it means I have to be the bad guy. But I'm just a post lady. I'm a messenger. I just take what he gives me. And hopefully I don't mess, mess, mess it up, and I just need to be faithful. Okay, so this is what the Lord says. Ezekiel's task as a watchman. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable. For their blood but if you but if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn okay but if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways they will die for their sins but you will have saved yourself again when a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil and i put a stumbling block before them they will die since you did not warn them they will die for their sin the righteous things that person did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin, and they do not sin, they will surely live because they took warning, and you will have saved yourself. So, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. What matters is this, is that the Lord is coming back as a warrior. He's not playing. He's not coming back as a, as a lamb anymore. Okay? He's already been that. And he is the Lion of Judah. But now he's coming back as a warrior, and he's not playing. He's coming back for a bride without spot and without wrinkle, and he's going to dress her one way or another. And he's going to get his church ready one way or another, and he is right now. And this is the call to that. It's already been happening. Everybody's been feeling trials, adversities, testings, furnace, the heat. It's a serious word, and now you know it. Get your house in order. Starts with me first, right here. And it doesn't feel good. But the crucible and the crushing are for a purpose. The fire is for a purpose. It gets rid of the impurities. It makes you pliable. And you bend to the will of God. Because at the end of the day, it's his will. Or it's the highway. Tough word, but we need it as a church. 
and it's humbled me and it makes me shake. I'm going to be honest with you because I am learning and, and this makes so much sense because this morning, I'm going to say this too. This morning, when I, when I wake up in the morning, I greet the Lord as my father and I greet Jesus. I greet the Holy Spirit in ways that I always have. But this morning, for some reason, it didn't feel right. And I said to the Lord, I, and now I get it. And I'm just getting this right now while I'm sitting here. I said, Lord, sometimes I feel like I'm just way too familiar with you. You're God. How do I teach me how to greet you in the right way? It's all coming together. It's all coming together. So please, church, wake up. Get up and let's get going. Get in line with the word of God. Whatever it takes, do what we have to do and get this gospel preached and really love people as Jesus loves us. That's the call. And we can learn and we can do it. And it's not too late. So let's get going. Have a great day.